morning guys uh with kaya doing the videos lately i thought it would be kind of fun to do a live stream just so that you knew we were all still alive and kicking and kind of to know what our plans are for the fall um the reason that i turned the videos over to kaya is that um she has kind of a fresh look a fresh idea and the girls are the ones doing all the chores, all the animal husbandry, all the milking, all the harvesting. They're pretty much doing everything outside anyway. And um, so it just made more sense to kind of get her take on things. Maybe she would be able to express things a little differently than I do. Maybe she would see things and be able to capture them on camera a little differently than I do. That and she enjoys the editing. So I thought that would be kind of fun. I'm kind of at a loss with the garden right now and with the, the homestead in general. Sorry, it's resting on my knees, so it's going to be a little, a little warbly. But I wanted to come on and just, and just talk about that. We have been on this property for, I think we got here in 2012 or 2013, been planting trees and putting down mulch and putting animals out in the orchards that, that whole time. I planted hundreds, if not thousands of trees. Not all of them made it. I'd say about three quarters of the trees did not make it. However, we've been here long enough that everything that lived has matured. And now we are starting to become a shady, fruitful permaculture oasis. And so I wanted to talk about what happens when you kind of reach the part where nature takes over and you don't have to do very much. It's actually kind of, I don't know if demoralizing is the right word, but it is kind of reality shifting because up until this point, I've had to work so hard to keep things alive and I've had to spend money to get mulch and I've had to spend money to get the right kind of animals out in the right spaces. I've had to spend money to put up fences there's been a lot of give and not a whole lot of receive up to this point in such a young, um, hi Grace, in such a young orchard system. So I'd actually recommend for any of you who are into growing your own food and you're buying a new property, I would say buy a property that already has trees on it. Buy a property that already has fruit trees on it. And then don't cut anything down. Don't remove any of the vegetation until you've lived there for a couple of years so that you can see why the original owners, the original planters of these trees put them where they did. It could be that they make an amazing wind block. It could be that their location protects your garden from deer. Deer are browsers, not necessarily grazers as much. They, they do graze, but they're like a goat. They like browse. And so if you have a big block of trees on the side where the deer come in, the deer will eat a lot of the tree branches before they get to your garden. A lot of times they'll be full before they get there. That's kind of how my garden is, is I have a lot of trees uh, uh, surrounding my garden without obstructing the garden from sun or anything like that. And so, um, sorry, let me turn that off. And so, there was strategy in that. And so if you're going, if you're buying a new property because suddenly you want a farmer, it's always been your dream and now you have the money because you sold your house in town, buy a property that already has mature trees. Mature trees take so little water to keep alive compared to young trees that take a massive amount of water because um, their roots are not as deep. They can't reach down for water that's 10, 20 feet down, depending on the kind of tree it is. And it just doesn't have the resources to take care of itself that an old tree does. The other thing is that in a, in a natural wild situation, a young tree would have shade protection from older trees. It would have all the mulch that was already from the leaf fall from the older trees. Whereas if you plant young trees, you are mama, you are papa, you are mulch, you are water, you are everything to that little tree. And so I don't recommend, if you can afford it, I don't recommend starting from scratch especially if you're in an area like mine where you don't get a lot of rain. We're in a high cold desert. And so every drop of water that those trees got came from me finding a way to get it there. And then when the soil was poor, I had to find a way to get manure to it. And then I had to go out and at, in the beginning, I had to mow everything 
and remulch it and remanure it. And then as the, it got older, I could put animals out that would mow for me, like the geese. But um, it was a very big learning experience. It took 10 years to get to where we are now. <sighs> that being said, having done all that babysitting for 10 years, I now find myself as an empty nester in the permaculture sense. I have, um, let's see, fear the honey badger. Good morning. Good morning. I am an empty nester as far as the permaculture goes. Uh, everything has taken off. We have to do minimal watering. All we really have to do is add a little bit of mulch once a year. And then um, I do water still because I have new trees that I planted under my old trees to fill in spots where things didn't survive. So very, very, very minimal things that have to be done for these little plants. But for the most part, it's all kind of doing its own thing. It It's difficult to kill things now. Uh, one of my viewers from the video that Kaya made yesterday, um, hi, Eric Hale. Uh, one of the things that uh, people asked about yesterday was how, how I trimmed the apple tree and the pear tree that was in the video about vinegar. And the funny thing there is that I was actually trying to kill those trees. Uh, they were trees that were mauled by goats and sheep within the first, oh, is it going to come back? Sorry, it's saying my connection is unstable. Um, those were my expensive grafted trees that I put in the first year we were here. And back in that, at that time, it was $60 for a nice potted grafted tree. Now it's a lot more than that. But uh, the goats and the sheep got into two of those trees. And I actually, three of those trees, three trees, four trees. How many trees? I don't remember. Over the course of the first few years we were here, we had uh, the goats get into the trees. And then when we had renters here, the rabbits escaped from their cages in the winter and girded the trees again. Now the trees survived. Uh, but over time I looked at them and thought, uh, they're not very pretty anymore. I'm not sure that the graft survived. I think it's just the rootstock coming back. And so I had gone and lopped off main branches from those trees and I was going to gird them and then kill them and cut them down and not have them there anymore. But I only got halfway through there. I just cut the main branches off. They'd never produced a lot of fruit. They'd never produced very good fruit. I did that last year. This year I have so much fruit on these trees. You just wouldn't believe it. Um, so somebody had asked about that. They'd asked about how I shaped those trees. I'm at the point where I'm try I'm having to remove and cut trees down and dig trees up and move them because uh, I didn't understand where the best places were for fruit trees when I first started planting them. I don't have them in the best places. Now I'm, I'm kind of a little heart sick at killing them, but um, moving a big pear tree is quite an undertaking and the odds of it surviving are not very good. So I might just cut it way, way back again. I don't know. Anyway, we're at that point with permaculture where it's taken over, I guess is the point is that they have established we're 10 years in and now all I have to do is just sit back and eat the fruit. As long as we add a little bit of mulch here and there from the rabbits, we don't have any weed problems. Um, let's see. I'll try and stick with my notes. For a fall project, um, again, now that the permaculture is finished and just spreading itself everywhere with seeds and birds and everything like that, I am trying to simplify the garden part of it as much as the permaculture has been simplified. And to do that, I would like to have all my hotbeds in the same place in rows and um, Instead of having any kind of different looking bed, like the metal beds or the low pallet, low pallet beds, I want everything to be lined up all in the same place, all watered in the same place because it's the kids, it's Paige and Kaya, that are actually doing the watering. They're doing all the gardening. I'm in the house cleaning and making meals and doing laundry uh, because that's what the need is right now and the girls need to learn how to do the permaculture they need to learn how to do the gardening for their own lives later when they have their own families so that's why we've transitioned mom is in the house kids are outside working it's all very straightforward very fast but um 
uh, it means that the simpler I can make it, the more that can get done, the more likely they are to want to do it when they leave home, and the more likely I am to be able to do it when they leave home myself when it transitions back to being something that I do. So what I have found is that row gardens are the easiest, whether they're in ground or above ground or hotbed. Straight lines are the easiest lines to water. And um, keeping it all in one place means you don't have to go check in multiple places. The walking back and forth just eats up your time. It's so not productive. Um, even though we have automatic watering lines to all the animals, uh, and that's been very straightforward. I haven't done that with the gardens. I have hotbeds in this spot, in this spot, in this spot, in this spot, and then I have the row garden in the front. And I also have some different types of garden beds that have to be watered by hand. And so I greatly complicated it for the girls in, in what they've been doing. And it's not kind to expect somebody else to do the work and yet make it redundant make it exhausting. We have two grow two greenhouses, one big greenhouse in the back, and they were having to walk all the way around the whole property to get back to that greenhouse. And so I spent over $300 to get a chain link fence and the posts. And um, we already had the concrete, but we, the girls and I, and one of Paige's friends came over and we installed a gate in the backyard chain link so that the kids could go straight from the backyard to the greenhouse without having to loop all the way around the property. We've thought about it for years. I never felt like I could justify the expense, but I saw that the girls were just exhausted. They were so worn out from trying to maintain greenhouses in so many different spaces and gardens in so many different spaces. And so I'm trying really hard as my goal in what it is that I'm doing now on the homestead is to simplify because I'm too tired after having been in the house doing laundry and vacuuming and dishes and meals and and getting the kids ready for school and supervising their school. I am too tired in my day at this point to be able to go out and do any gardening or any milking <clears throat> the way that I have it set up now. Which means that I need to listen to them when they are tired and find solutions. So hence, again, we have the gate. Eric Hale said, most people don't realize how much work gardening is. It really can be because the gardening doesn't just entail the planting. It also is watering. It's uh, weeding if you have weeds. And then the biggest thing I think that people just don't, it, don't, it don't, doesn't occur to people is the harvesting and the cooking. Um, if you're going to be gardening, half the work is getting that food from the garden into the house to be cooked. Um, and that is half of my battle is that in the summer months when I'm really, really just running as fast as I can, I really struggle to get out there and get things harvested and have it come back in the house to be cooked. I have to send children out to harvest the corn. I have to send children out to get the Swiss chard. I have to send children out to get the tomatoes. It, in, in what I already have in my day, it's, I, I can't get out there to harvest it. And so once again, because of the, here's the thing, a successful homestead is all about cycles. It's all about feedback loops and it's about efficient, efficiency in those feedback loops. For instance, the manure from the rabbits goes into the hotbeds. The hotbeds heat up and we can do winter gardening. Now, once that winter garden has turned into a spring garden, we start to have things go to seed. Those plants that are going to seed now go to feed the goats, the rabbits, and the pigs. Now, the goats make milk from those overgrown plants, and we that milk comes into our house to make cheese, and then the way from that cheese goes out to feed the pigs. Now, if we didn't have the pigs, we would have whey that didn't really have anywhere to go to because there's a limit to how much whey chickens and ducks and things like that will eat whey. And then, um, I wonder why my dogs are making so much noise. Sorry. Um, and so if I didn't have the pigs, I'd have a lot of garden produce that the other animals really can't eat very much of. The pigs eat all the stuff that the rabbits and the goats and everybody else won't eat. And um, 
So by having these loops, the, these feedback loops, that one thing feeds another thing, feeds another thing, feeds another thing, um, you have efficiency. The trick, the trick is to take advantage of those feedback loops. And it's a lot of cranial gymnastics sometimes. Once you find the right animal for the right space that does the right thing, and you get them established, it's pretty straightforward. It's not a big deal, like the geese. The geese in the orchards are amazing. They keep all the grass down and they poop, so they fertilize under the trees where there's a lot of water. The ducks do the same thing, except they eat roots and they eat bugs. And so um, the ducks are also in the orchards, but they, we also get eggs from them, which is fantastic. And they fertilize the orchards. Now, if we didn't have chickens, uh, we couldn't put mulch down and have it be a success because the ducks would flatten all the mulch and it, they compact the soil. But the chickens come back and fluff it up. But we can only have two or three chickens at a time because they fluff too much and they they spread the mulch so much that it can't do its job. So it's very much an ecosystem. And um, it can be exhausting just to think about it if you don't set it up the right way. Hey, Good Times Homestead, how are you? Um, so uh, the gardening, the in-ground gardening is what my weak spot because in order to garden, I need a lot of mulch. And here in our area, because we're arid, we don't have a lot of like tree things happening at any given time. It's hard to get free mulch, free wood chips. And so I have a hard time in my head thinking that it's worth it to put a thousand dollars worth of wood chips on my garden in here, which is what it would cost. Um, instead, what I'm trying to do right now is have the geese, not the geese, the goats and the sheep up in the front garden, in the row garden, so that every time we feed them, we put poop in the soil. Every time we feed them, we get their leftover hay in the soil and it mulches in place and it doesn't cost us anymore. I'm trying to do that. But it's a slow process. Having just the animals do it by themselves instead of you putting a lot of mulch down is a very slow process um, it, over a 5,000 square foot area. It, it's, it's a big deal. Um, my dogs are out there trying to kill each other. Hopefully you can't hear them. All right. So the other thing with an in-row garden is you really don't want to be watering the pathways. My watering system works really very, very well. But I do have to keep, once I have the garden in, I really do have to keep a lot of mulch on it in order for it to work. So for this fall, the only project I can really think of that I want to do is to get all the hot beds moved out of the backyard and next to the uh, big greenhouse to build them all again new using new pallets to make them more secure and to put covers over the top of them so that they turn into big greenhouses. That is my fall goal. I'm, I have to wait to do that until we've had a, a couple of frosts, a couple of freezes, uh, so that there aren't any yellow jackets in the pallets and so that we can um, not be worrying about stinging things. Um, thanks, good times. Uh, that, that's kind of my goal right now is to, is to get all that moved. And then because I already have all the deep mulch in the backyard, and I have most of my expensive fruit trees in the backyard. I will probably just make some low beds that are all lined up right next to each other, not randomly scattered all over the backyard, but lined up together very efficiently so that I can add rabbit manure to them and then put in an automatic watering system for those the same way that I have for the hotbeds. And then I would probably put strawberries um, in those. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So, um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, so what you see in me right now and the fact that you see that Kai has taken over the filming is just that I really, I don't have anything that needs to be done outside by me. I have run out of projects and that's not really a good thing for me because without a project, I'm kind of at loose ends. And again, I, I can't do the, the big hotbed switch until later in the year because we do get we do get yellow jackets inside the hotbed because the pallets. Usually what I'll do is in the spring as I start to see 
uh, yellow jacket nests evolve in the hotbeds, I'll just take a high power water sprayer and go spray the nests off and then we don't have a problem. Currently, we don't have a problem in the hotbeds. However, our yellow jackets are not very aggressive. They, they have a tendency to be very mellow. And so there could be a few yellow jacket nests in there that I don't know about. And because of that, I don't want us, me or the kids getting stung. And so we will wait until it's a little later in the year before we start taking things apart. That, and it's a massive undertaking. Every one of those hotbeds has a ton, literally one ton of wet, soft, decomposing material in it. And so in order to take a hotbed apart, I need to already have a hotbed put together to receive that material. And um, it, it would be like taking a garbage dump site and just moving it with wheelbarrows at this point because everything is decomposed. Oh my gosh, it would be such a mess if I just left it out and didn't cover it or didn't get it moved once I have things taken apart. Yeah, Eric Hill said, I try to mulch with gl grass clippings, but it takes a lot to cover a very big area. Exactly. Just for the backyard, we'll put two or three tons of wood mulch or old hay in the backyard a year, two or three tons. Uh, in order to do the front garden, which is my row garden, in order to do it completely and uh, well, it would take, it would take about 20 tons of sawdust to put on our garden. And the problem with just putting sawdust down is that if you don't have manure being put down at the same time, any kind of mulch, if you don't have manure being put down at the same time, it, it sterilizes your soil. The way, the reason it worked in the backyard was because we had ducks in there that every time we put down a little bit of mulch, they'd come and poop on it. And so it would energize and, and rehabilitate the soil. I think the reason why it's going to work better for me to do it with the goats in the front yard is because if I put a little bit down at a time, the goats come and eat the hay, they poop. I move their feed station on a little bit. I give them hay, they poop. And so not only are they eating weeds as they go, they're pooping and they're mulching with their feed. Uh, if I were to go in and mulch with wood mulch around the area where they eat as they're eating, that would work. But if I just went in and put in 20 tons of sawdust, or wood mulch, what would happen is I would still have weeds in that space because all the seeds would blow in and the seeds would come up from the bottom and I would once again have weeds. By doing it in a layer system with livestock, they eat the weeds, they mulch a little bit, they manure, and it creates soil instead of just having a massive amount of uh, wood mulch on the top. So... My dogs are trying to kill each other and nobody else is home. They're out picking up hay right now. So prepping for life. Hello. Hello. Robert Rittenhouse. Grass clippings for me kept weeds away the best. I experimented on different beds, but I need a bagger for the riding mower to make that feasible next year. <coughs> so the problem with grass clippings for me is that my whole property is grazed by my animals. My lawn is grazed by sheep and geese. My orchard is grazed by geese. My main pasture is grazed by the goats. And so I have no grass left over to mulch with. Oh my gosh. My dogs. I'm sitting here listening to them kill each other. I should go put them out. Um, okay, pre dried, that is. Green didn't work as well. Yeah, green. It kind of has a tendency just to rot and smell nasty or to heat up. You have to be really careful with grass clippings around fruit trees because if you just dump it around fruit trees, it heats up and it'll actually kill your fruit trees. Um, okay, good times said they can't hear the dogs. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I am actually worried about the dogs. They literally sound like they're killing each other. So I don't know what else you guys want to know about that. Uh, right now I am writing once a week on my Patreon just as things come in and out of my mind as I'm trying to deal with my empty nester permaculture property. Um, I, it's kind of depressing. I don't, I don't really know what to say about that. I have all the materials I need to make the new hotbeds. 
I've shown you guys how to do the hotbed greenhouses. And because I have shown you how to do the hotbed greenhouses, I feel like I have finished a project. Can I show it better? Can I do a better ebook than I have? Yes, I could. Um, but I have the basic information out there. And so I feel like until I have a really incredible new thing to show you guys, oh, guys, look, I figured it out. I My, my mind is empty. Um, my kids are completely full up of all the fruit that's on the trees. And so they're happy. And so the, the main purpose of why I put the orchard in is being fulfilled. The geese are super happy right now. Um, the ducks are super happy right now. The ch Everybody's super happy right now. And yet I'm at a loss for a project. And so I am a little bit in the doldrums of trying to find, I don't, I don't want to redo what somebody else has done. There are a lot of people out there right now that are still showing great, amazing gardening and permaculture videos, and they're doing it very well, like uh, Deep South Homestead. They're very good at it. I have reached an equilibrium with my animals to where I'm. it's costing me almost nothing to feed them. Uh, they're still, we're, we're at a point where the freezers are full. I don't need to rebreed anybody right now. I just, I'm, I'm at a huge, I'm at a huge loss. I don't want to call it like depression or anything, but <laughs> empty nester, maybe. I don't know. Once things succeed and you're at that point where you're at equilibrium and they don't need anything from you, what's your purpose in life? Maybe I'm going through a midlife crisis. Um, let's see. Um, oh, they're talking about grass. So, yeah, that's why Kai has taken videos is because I have been doing what she's doing for so many years now that it's kind of boring. I, I pre When I go out and do it, I appreciate the time with the animals. When I go out to the orchards, I appreciate looking at the beautiful trees, but they don't need me anymore. Uh, they literally just don't need me anymore. The For years, we had problems with those little tent worms, those little nasty green worms that wrap around fruit trees and build that cocoon-like thing, and they eat the tree. We've had problems with that before, but the last couple of years, last year we had just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of that caterpillar predation, but only a tiny bit and just on the gooseberries. This year, the gooseberries are so big and massive and we have so many birds out there in the orchard eating the bugs that we had no predation on any of the trees. Uh, there's barely any worm holes in the apples. The pears are great. The peaches are fine. Everybody's so happy without me. <laughs> what is my purpose? What is my purpose at this point? And so the only thing that really needs me is like management in the house. And the girls know how to butcher everything. The girls know how to get everything bred. The girls know how to move the animals between all their barns. The girls know how to feed them. They know how to mineral them. And so, um, I need to find myself a project before I just kind of lose interest in the permaculture thing. Cats and dogs said, educate others on how your system works. So that's one of the struggles I've had and why I've handed things over to Kaya is because I feel like when I show the interconnected nature of the homestead, that most people are not interested in it. They want me to tell them to be afraid of the end of times. If my videos, if I were to put videos up that had big pictures about how the world's going to end and how we're all going to starve and how you need to do prepper gardening now or you're going to die. If I were to do videos like that, they would get views because it gives people an adrenaline rush and, um, it makes them scared. And so it makes them feel like by watching my video, they're motivated to go do something. And the reality is, is I don't like to be scared. I, I, I like to learn new skills, but I don't, I don't like feeling manipulated by people putting up videos about how the world okay. end is coming. Oh, I can hear my dogs. Um, okay. I'm going to see if I can go with my dogs. Oh, don't do that. I try to die. Um, I don't know. Why it's not plugging in. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> they're just gonna have to whine without me. I don't know why they're sad. Um, what was I saying? I don't remember what I was saying. Oh, I don't like to be scared by the videos that people put out. 
I don't want to have an adrenaline rush because of videos I see on YouTube. I want people instead to tell me what skill they're going to teach me. And I want to be able to go with that. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I haven't put up any scary videos, even though I could, even though I could say, hey, if you don't have this and you don't have that, you're not going to be able to get it later. I could say that. But instead, what I've done is I've gone out and I've harvested weeds for my pigs, pig weed and lamb's quarters and stuff like that. And I've shown feeding my pigs these weeds. Hey, I've got pigs that can subsist on whey from my goats uh, and weeds. And when I talk about that, when I talk about how breed differences are massive and you really need to have livestock that doesn't require commercial feed. When I talk about things like that, it's a very, very small part of my audience. I think a wise part of my audience, you know, but a very, very small minority, like maybe 1,500, 2,000 people want to see that. And and so do I still make the video? Yes, I still make the video, but I feel a little demoralized that such a tiny percentage of the people who seem to care about growing their own food and that kind of thing understand the importance of these systems of having a system for your animals on your property. People want to get into homesteading, not realizing that cost them thousands of dollars a year to feed them if they're feeding them retail food. If you buy a type of animal that can only live and grow on retail food, if you're buying a, a York pig, why are they crying? Okay, guys, I've got to go do something about my dogs really quick. I'll be right back. They seem very sad. Okay, sorry about that, guys. All right. So, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that when I give information, even if it's a little video, I feel like it's missing my audience. They're not hearing it or they feel powerless about it. And so what's the point? What's the point of making the videos? Um Hi, American Eden. Hey, Marie. Um, good time said, get into some collaborations, cook stuff, read your blog post with the beautiful yard behind you. That's a great idea. Um, and so let's see if I can get some of these comments that I missed. Robert Rittenhouse said, I transitioned into indoor gardening during the winter. That said, we put out cold crops as well for the first time. Um, I want to rely less on chicken feed. I'm free ranging, but still feel the need. I need bags of food. Okay. Cats and dogs said, consult with new homesteaders on how to organize their property to sustain long term. I have done that. There are people here locally who have asked me to come out and look at their properties and help them figure it out. And usually what I find is that their schemes are so big and their understanding of how much space it takes to grow food easily is really unbalanced. They want to have 20 acres in fencing, not realizing that 20 acres with fencing is going to cost them thousands and thousands of dollars that a lot of times building your homestead is as expensive as building your house <laughs> if you want it to be big and grand and beautiful which is why I show people how to build stuff with pallets is because um, the first time you are building your homestead you need to do it as cheaply as possible because a lot of the things that you're going to try are not going to work and so if you're putting in permanent buildings and permanent fences on a grand scale when you first get there if you have the cash to do it, I guess you can, but a lot of times it won't work. Even if you have cash to do it all perfectly, you're going to put things in the wrong place. And unless you have hired help <clears throat> to do things, which everybody that you're watching on YouTube that is a big deal right now or has big property, they either have two or three tractors that do a lot of really amazing things. They're receiving things for free from companies like greenhouses to put up. Or they actually have a hired hand or four 
to help them with things like with Justin Rhodes. He has a guy that actually is his hired hand that does what he's doing. And then he has a family down the road that comes and helps with things. And then he has somebody who edits his videos and he probably has people that help him put together his website and stuff like that. And so a lot of what you see when people are buying tons and tons and tons of really nice non-GMO food or putting in a lot of outbuildings or having new tractors, there's something going on behind the scenes that would make it um, a completely different situation from what you're doing. And so that's why I try to keep things very, very simple and why instead of me trying to make my homestead more profitable. Instead, what I'm doing is cutting down on my expenses on my homestead so that I can match my viewers' needs and also cut back on the amount of time I have to spend making money for the homestead. Instead, I want the homestead to pay for itself by making it as inexpensive as possible and self-reliant as possible because during hard times, those emergency times that are in all the thumbnails right now, during those times, you want a pig that can make it on weeds. You want to have a garden that doesn't have to be watered. Uh, you want permaculture things in place that you don't have to touch because you're going to maybe be hauling water from your well that you don't have to hand pump because there's no electricity. Um, and so I, I'm just very jumbled about all of it. I, I, I see the big scary thumbnails that are on YouTube right now and, and they affect me. And yet I don't feel good about making big, scary thumbnails because I, I don't want to do to other people what they do to me uh, as far as the anxiety that it creates. Barn Raised by Jesse. Oh, I like your name, Barn Raised. Fun. Um, by, Barn Raised by Jesse said, I'm always interested in fruit tree prunings and upkeep, particularly keeping curculio worms from rag ravaging my plum trees. Do you spray? Okay. So what I do in order to keep the little worms away is that I do permaculture planting, which is that I have herbs and bushes underneath fruit trees. I keep ducks always under my fruit trees and mulch underneath my fruit trees. And so when things like that fall from fruit trees, the ducks and the chickens eat them. And the other thing I do is I don't discourage any of my wild birds. I do not net anything. And everything is planted very close together and mixed. And what I have found is that all the birds come from my neighbors who shoots his birds that steal fruit. They come here and what they eat here is bugs. I have very little loss of fruit to birds, but I don't have any loss to insects when I have as many birds around as I do. I have so many different birds. I don't even know what they all are, but I don't spray anything. The birds are welcome to eat the little bit of grain that they care to eat from the chicken bowl. Um, but the, the ducks and the chickens eat all the bugs that they can find from the ground. And if you have little chicks, they'll actually hop into the branches of your fruit bushes to eat the bugs. It's, it's pretty amazing. So um, I try to have it be as natural a setting as I possibly can with as much variety mixed in with lots of mulch and lots of poultry, not chickens, because your chickens will scratch up all your mulch, mostly ducks with a few chickens. Um, hey, Forrest. <sighs> Let's see, Good Time said, I have 5.75 acres and feel like it's just right. You get some free things and greenhouses. Uh, five, almost six acres is a pretty good amount. Uh, my parents had 12 when I was a kid, 12 acres, and most of it was grazing and hay ground. And over time, my dad needed multiple types of tractors. Over time, he had to replace all his field fencing with cow panels. Over time, he had to put in not T-posts, but railroad ties type things in order to keep the cows in. And so he was always having to put money in and um, there was just always a lot of work for him to do and he enjoyed it and it's the reason I didn't want a really big property is because I could see that maybe I could raise most of my meat in the backyard with rabbits and plant a lot of my fruit trees in the backyard so that I could maintain them and water them easier 
And um, my parents burned out on their farm because of the amount of money that went into it to keep it nice. And um, even though my dad is incredibly smart and just smart with money and careful with how he never went into debt to make his farm nicer. But um, it was always imbalanced about how much food came in for the amount of work he put in, which is why I want a homestead that takes care of itself, even if it leaves me a little bit in the blues while I'm trying to figure out my next project. Um, having my homestead now just take care of itself and the kids being able to look two little girls being able to take care of the whole homestead in an hour in the morning and 15 minutes at night. That's, that's pretty cool. That's, that's the animals in the permaculture part. I, I want to make the gardens easier, more accessible. Uh, because for one thing, I don't want to feel overwhelmed when I go out to try and like fix things that the girls may not have perfectly. But also just to find a way to engage myself back in again in the homestead. I feel very disengaged from it right now. All right. So Forrest said, what animals don't need commercial food? So I work very hard with my animals that they all are as free range as possible. And I don't keep animals that require formulate, formulated form, form, formula pellets. So my rabbits do not require pellets. My rabbits survive on food that is grown locally. They eat hay that was grown locally. They eat sunflower seeds and they eat a little bit of grain. The sunflower seeds and the grain are like a tablespoon a day. And that's all. And most of the rest is hay and cuttings from trees and garden stuff. So that's the rabbits. The rabbits don't cost me anything to feed them. Um, and they make money for the homestead and they fill the freezer and they give us manure. So they're amazing. The pigs that we have are a cross between a Cooney Cooney, an American guinea hog, and a Julian breed. All of them are small, lard type breeds of pigs. They're very small. And um, they get to about... 200 pounds at max. That's where our boar is that we're about to butcher. They grow slow, but they can live on food scraps and hay and whey and um, weed cuttings and things like that. But I don't buy formula pellets for them. I will get them a little bit of grain in the winter and I'll cook it on the wood stove so that it swells up and gives them something warm to eat. But they, they are very inexpensive to feed. And they have babies very nicely and they breed without any trouble and they need small shelters and they're easy to keep in the fences. They're very gentle animals. And um, this year we made money from babies being sold. We didn't need to keep all of them. And the meat is very nutrient dense so that for our whole family, it's like maybe two cups, maybe a cup and a half of meat feeds our family of four. And so even though they're a small pig, uh, we make use of everything we possibly can on those pigs. And we breed them ourselves. So those are our pigs. For our goats, they each give a, a gallon of milk a day. We butcher the babies just as they wean. And we get enough meat off of it to make it worth it. What else? They make us cheese. They feed the pigs. They graze the land. And uh, they leave manure and... Their leftover feed goes in the garden. I mean, you know, it all, you know, manure can go to the fruit trees, that kind of thing. I'm trying to think who else. And then we have the sheep. The sheep are our lawn mowers. They mow the lawn. They mow the sides of the roads. They can, around the big fruit trees, they mow around the big fruit trees. They just can't be let around really small fruit trees that aren't covered because they want to eat all the leaves. They don't harm the bark, but they will eat all the leaves off. So uh, what else? The ducks eat the slugs and the bugs around the fruit trees. They eat a very, very small amount of grain. We do leave them grain, but they mostly ignore it. Uh, the geese just eat grass during the growing season. And um, they take a little bit of grain in the winter, but not very much. And they guard all of the animals. We haven't had a loss in our ducks or our chickens since we got geese. And so they are good guard animals. Um, good times said we have, you have 176,000 followers. I think you're a big deal. 
You're so inspiring. My chickens and guineas do love lamb squatters. Isn't that interesting what the animals love? Like my turkeys love Swiss chard. I think it's because it has earwigs in it sometimes, but they, they will eat Swiss chard and kale like nobody's business. Thank you for your kind words. So yes, I have 176,000 followers. So I think people kind of bookmark me as far as like, um, they want to know I'm still there and they want to kind of check in and see what kind of videos I'm making. But unless I do a big dramatic video in which I'm showing something spectacular and something new that nobody else is doing, most people don't really want to watch, which I think is sad because in a lot of my little videos, I'm doing my like daily, a daily report of what's working and what's not working. I understand that people are busy. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that my viewers are busy in their lives. They're not glued to YouTube all the time. Um, like you guys, you're here on, is it a Saturday? I think it's a Saturday. You all have jobs. You all have important things to do. You're not glued to your YouTube in a way that damages your life. So I don't want, I don't want my viewers glued to YouTube in order not to miss a video, but I do worry sometimes that the most important thing I have to say, which is about, Hey, get some low input, high output animals instead of buying these commercial breeds of animals get some things that are very inexpensive to feed and very inexpensive to house and that are small enough that you can butcher them yourselves so that you don't have to pay the 150 200 it costs to have somebody butcher your animal for you we butcher all of our own animals we butcher our goats we butcher our sheep we butcher our pigs we butcher our rabbits everything that goes into our freezer we butchered ourselves i couldn't do that well i have done it I have done it with a 350 pound pig. I don't recommend it. So much easier to butcher my 150 to 200 pound pigs. Um, same thing with the goats. I don't wait until they're two years old to butcher them. I butcher them at three months when they wean, when the flavor is what I want. And um, the same thing goes for lambs. I much prefer to butcher them at six months than at two years. I try really hard to make it easy on myself and on my family. And those are the little tips I'm trying to share is like, hey, guys, cut down on the size of your animals and then you can butcher them yourselves and it won't cost as much. Cut down on the type of animal. Only keep the types of animals that you actually care to eat. If you notice you're not butchering the animals because you're overwhelmed by it, then maybe cut down on the number of animals. Uh, but I think it's really important for people to analyze what it is they're keeping, what they're not keeping, and really look into the psychology of why maybe you're not butchering your animals. Maybe you're afraid to butcher them. Maybe um, because they cost so much, you feel like you have too much into it to make a mistake about killing the animal and butchering it. So butcher them younger. If butchering a big 200 pound sheep is overwhelming, butcher a 75 pound sheep. That's what I do with anything that I feel overwhelmed by, whether it's a pig or a goat or a sheep, I butcher them very young the first few times I butcher them so that if I make a mistake, I don't feel like it was a major loss in feed. Um, maybe I can, you know, save a little bit of the meat if I really made a mistake. Maybe I can cook it all in one day and just put it right in the fridge if I if I really made a mistake. But I don't wait until I have five or six hundred dollars of feed into an animal to learn how to butcher that animal. I do it when they're young, which is why I also don't spend very much on my animals. With very few exceptions, I. I get my animals for like $25, $15 a piece. With my sheep, I get bum lambs for $15. I raise them up to be my breeding stock. Um, same thing with the pigs. I spent $25 a piece on them. Some of them I got for free as a trade for a sheep. I, I just try really hard to not spend so much on my animals that I'm afraid to butcher them. All right, so... Um, Cats and dogs said, I'm just purchased 22 acres. 20 acres are hardwoods. That's amazing. Good job. Yeah, two acres that is manageable and small enough to put a garden on that. I think that's really wise. Um, okay, Forrest said, American guinea hog pigs. So I have raised straight American guinea hog pigs, and then I have raised American guinea hog pigs that are crossed with two other things. What I have found is that the cross that I like is the Julian. They look kind of like a rat. They're a Chinese breed of pig. Juliana, Julian. They're not the teacup size. They're the normal size pig that's a Juliana breed. They're lean. They're ugly. And 
I did not mean lean. They're very lean as far as like they're long. They don't get fat the same way that an American guinea hog does. We crossed Julian with guinea, American guinea hog and we liked that much better than the American guinea hog by itself. The American guinea hog by itself, I don't know if it's inbred or what, but they just seem to get too fat too fast and um, they have a hard time walking after a while. So we found that mixing a Cooney Cooney with a Juliana or mixing an American guinea hog with a Juliana gave it the, um, the, the, the hybrid integrity, the hybrid vigor that we wanted. We've had, and, and so again, you're not getting a pot, a Juliana is not a pot belly pig. It is, it looks more like a rat. They're kind of a long pig and they stay skinny. And with any of those pigs, you don't want to give them formulated feed. You want to give them scraps. You want to give them a tiny, tiny bit of like scratch grain or something and a little bit away. And hey, you don't want to give them formulated feed because they get fat so fast. And, um, and we love that about them. We love that we can feed them on what is here. And if we do have to buy formulated feed, we get pot belly pig feed because Okay, it's trying to reconnect. Um, Marie said, yes, that's true. But when I have time to sit down and watch, I binge watch and catch up on all that I've missed. Yeah, and I I try really hard. I try really hard. And that's why I don't mind that that the viewers don't watch all my videos is I figure um, if you've already learned what I'm talking about, there's no reason to rewatch it. And that's why I don't watch a lot of YouTube homesteading channels anymore is because I've kind of absorbed it all. I know what works for what I'm doing. and um, I have better things to do than just sit on YouTube and watch YouTube of things I already know how to do. And so I know there's a lot of people who've already seen what I've made. And so I make little blips of things that I think maybe people have missed or things that are important, but I try to keep them short. And otherwise I'll, I'll kind of try to, I'm, what I'm trying to do right now is store up ideas of things I haven't shown people, which is mostly just the big hotbed greenhouse that I'm going to build. That's the one I think would really make a difference in people's lives. So when I start to make videos again, I'll probably make one big video of the hotbed greenhouse. And, uh, because I think that is important and it is important for a lot of people to see it. And until then, I'm going to let Kaya show all the beautiful little things that she sees on the property and share in her heart what she loves about homesteading. And I think it'll be much more genuine than me trying to re-talk about things I've been talking about for so many years now. Um, cats and dogs said, Julie, keep in mind your audience's need will change as the economic and political. Uh, yeah, that's right. And political conditions change. I was a teenager in the 1970s. Things looked bad then. So that is very, very true. What I do hope is that people will go back and look at my old videos because I do have old videos that talk about things like um, food storage and how I do food storage or about what I was doing when I was planting my living fences. I did make the videos and some of them I think are actually pretty good. And I don't, but I don't want to remake them now because the way the algorithm works is that unless a video gets a massive bump the minute that it's public, it doesn't show the videos to people anyway. So if I'm only getting like 500 to 2,000 views a video anyway, unless I make a really big scary thumbnail, people aren't watching it because YouTube isn't showing it to people. And so the odds of people finding my old videos that have more views is a lot stronger than it is for them to find my new videos that I make unless I put a big scary thumbnail on it. Does that make sense? So there's a lot more chance of them seeing my old videos than of seeing my new videos just because back in the day when I made those videos, I was one of the few people on YouTube that was making homesteading videos. So they got more views, they got more push. Now they don't, which is okay. But I, I, if, if, if the videos don't get a big enough push the minute that they come up, they're not going to be seen by anybody. Even if people would be interested in the topic, YouTube won't show them because they didn't get enough traffic at the beginning of when I, I uploaded them. Hey, Palmetto. Hey, it's good to see ya. Um, all right, cats and dogs said, comparing the 1970s to today, things look worse today. Your example of how to feed your animals and family from your acre and a half are encouraging. I'm glad it's encouraging, and I try to be encouraging. And I try really hard not to overcomplicate it. 
um, just by showing myself cutting weeds and feeding it to the pigs. I'm trying to show, look, this is really how simple it is. Um, having the right breed of animal changes so much of the headache that is homesteading. Finding animals locally that are more resistant to the parasites in your area, that are uh, better able to survive in your area without a lot of uh, vet input. Like I don't keep an animal that gets mastitis. I will not. I cannot afford to have vet bills. So in the beginning, I had some animals that came into my possession uh, that were expensive animals, but they got mastitis. I gave them one chance and they got mastitis again. And so I sold that animal to somebody telling them this animal gets mastitis and they decided they were just going to give that milk to pigs or something. They still wanted the animal. I told them that she got mastitis, but I will not bring an animal that has diseases into my property because I cannot afford vet bills. Um, same thing with these pigs, the American guinea hog. We had a need for vet bills with her. And so we don't do straight American guinea hog anymore. I combine her with these other three. And now I have a really hardy little British uh, pig. Same thing with my sheep. I get them from a really reputable uh, place. And then I do not expose them to other sheep because I cannot afford vet bills. But I also don't buy expensive animals. I do not buy for the most part, registered animals. My goats are an exception because my source for goats is amazing and they are registered, but they're also the healthiest goats I've ever owned. So my, my goats are an exception, but my first goats that I bought from her were more like her cast off goats, not her top of the line goats. Um, but they were healthy. And then I, I upgraded by breeding to get her, her, uh, her better goats. All right, so cats and dogs said, how many years did it take for you to get to the 15 minutes in the morning and an hour at night standard? Five to seven years? Did your family cross-country trip help in your education? Oh, good questions. So how many years did it take? So we got here, I think, in 2012 or 2013. And in the beginning, I kept all the animals in the backyard. I didn't have fencing. And so everything that I had had to come secondhand. I didn't have a, an income from YouTube yet. I was a stay-at-home mom. And with two little girls, an 18 month old and a four year old. And so all my animals were tiny and I kept them all in my backyard. And when we had a tax return, we went and bought some fruit trees. And that was the beginning of all this. So we are now at the 10 year mark. And this year is the first year that it has all been very straightforward and easy. The one thing that I did that cost money that made the biggest difference in the world was that over the last two years. So in 2020 and 2021, I bought cow panel fencing. And instead of having my animals out on stakes and instead of having bad fencing, I just put in good fencing and it cost me thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. Did I have the money? Yes. I had an Airbnb that was going. And so one of the reasons that I needed all this good fencing was to keep my animals separated from the Airbnbers. So I went and bought thousands of dollars of cow panels and T posts. And I fixed all of my fences up. Um, not all of my fences were fixed by cow panels. Some of them, about half my fences, I, I fixed with free materials that I still had. But in the spots where I didn't have good enough material for like goats in particular, I bought fencing. By putting up fencing... In the spots where I needed fencing, I took three quarters of my problems away. Now, I have an acre and a half of property. If you have 20 acres and you try to put in 20 acres worth of fencing, you need to do it with cash and still have major amounts of cash left over in order to do that. That fencing will never pay you back. Never. It'll never pay you back ever, ever, ever. This fencing that I have out here, this, these thousands of dollars worth of fencing will never pay me back. The only way that this benefits me is peace of mind. I now don't have to do X, Y, and Z on my property. I know that the animals are contained. I know that they're safe. So what that fencing does is it gives you peace of mind. The way that it paid me back was that I didn't have like a lawsuit from Airbnb because some of these kids got in with my animals and accidentally got hurt. 
But as far as like the food that comes back into your house from that fencing, I would have to raise an awful lot of sheep and goats and pigs and everything else in order to make back the money from that fencing. However, my peace of mind was important. As the person doing the farming, it was really important that I not go crazy trying to do things on the scale that I was. And, um, and so it was just an easy tax. Those thousands of dollars were easy tax. And pretty much that's the only money I've ever really spent that was a massive amount of money on my homestead was those cow panels. All right. So the reason it's easy for my kids is because I put in the right fencing, but I only have an acre and a half and I only put it in where I absolutely had to put it. All right. So, and it took 10 years. If I had put those fences in sooner, it would not have taken 10 years because I could have stopped paying attention to the animals that were not in good enough fencing. And I could have paid more attention to my automatic drip system. And I could have, you know, made that easier. But, um, and so that's really all it did is it, it lifted the burden of worry off of my mind so that I could fix my watering system. And now ta -da, it's all done. Um, Marie, right, I really want to learn more about the hot greenhouse. Yes, the hot greenhouse is essential if you want to grow in the winter, even in places like the UK, many, 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 many places in the world, they used a system of hot compost to start their gardens in the winter. Generally, you want to start it in January and plant things in February because of the daylight. The daylight is long enough for most seeds to germinate once you get to February 12th. Um, let's see. Mark Antony said, really enjoy your channel. Just joined in. So apologies if you've already covered this, but what percentage of your family's food do you grow yourself? So we grow all of our own fruit in our growing season between May and the end of October. I don't do a lot of canning because my stomach's my, my stomach, my family's stomachs, our family doesn't do real well with canning. Um, I do a lot of dehydrating and, um, uh, we've done some fermenting too. Depending on the year, we grow probably about 80% of our fresh vegetables here. And de depending on how religious I am about getting my hotbed in on time, that is uh, that is providing food for my family from the beginning of April until December. We have a very long growing season if I use the hotbeds. I do grow our meat except for beef. If our family wants beef, we do get it from the grocery store. We don't eat a lot of beef. But um, I grow duck, uh, chicken, quail, rabbit, pig, goat, sheep. I think I got everything. So we have freezers full of meat. And then we grow almost all of our dairy. Uh, sometimes my husband forgets that I've just made cheese and he'll pick up cheese at the grocery store. Um, but... We have from the goats, we have our own milk, we have our own yogurt, we have our own cheese. Um, and then goat cream is a little difficult to separate. So the one thing that is kind of a staple in our fridge uh, is sour cream and butter. However, we do grow our own fats from our animals too. So most of our cooking fats are from sheep, ducks, and pigs. So we grow our own cooking fat too. And oddly enough, my favorite cooking fat is sheep. Uh, our sheep have a tendency to be very fat and carry a lot of fat in their internal organs, which is like kidney fat. And that, oh my gosh, it's so nice. The, our, the last sheep that we butchered had two gallons of rendered, like after I harvested all the fat off the sheep from the internal organs, I rendered it and we ended up with eight, six to eight quarts of beautiful white sheep fat. And it's been amazing to cook with. It's so easy to cook with. And um, I like it better than pork fat. So what else is there? What else would be? The thing that we don't grow ourselves is grains. We don't grow grains or seeds for ourselves. But we don't eat very much of it to begin with. Um, we do grow all of our own potatoes. And um, let's see. We grow all of our own greens all year. Beets. Uh, that kind of thing. 
So um, do we get vegetables from the grocery store? We do. We do get gro uh, vegetables from the grocery store. Not a lot, but depending on the season and in order to make it easier for the girls, we do buy some frozen vegetables. Um, bye, Warren. Well, I'm at a paratrooper said I'm in the process of putting up six foot welded wire fencing. Yeah. If you're going to do goats, it's got to be high or cow panels. Uh, cats and dogs said sounds like quality fencing. Hotbeds are key to permaculture. Thanks for the answer. Uh, Joe Duggan says you're blessed. I am very blessed. Christian Hansen said, um, Palmetto says his fencing keeps mostly deer off the garden and orchard. Marie said that was worth it. Good. All right, so I'm going to head out, check on my dogs, see what else needs to be done. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Kaya's videos. In order for the video that I make that will be about the hotbed greenhouses to get any traction, we do still have to make a weekly video. And so Kaya is doing that. If you have requests for her, uh, make sure to let us know. She's currently making a video about what it takes to take care of the dairy goats in the morning. And that will be her next video. And we appreciate you guys watching and all your support. If any of you support me on Patreon, I really appreciate it. And that is where I have a lot of my smaller thoughts that come from what I'm working on on the homestead at. It's on Patreon. And I was trying to do it daily, but I'm I'm trying to be off the computer and really focus on keeping the house going, using as much from the garden as I can. And so it's a once a week thing. So for those of you who support me there, thank you very much. If you guys are interested in all the hotbed stuff I'm talking about, it is on the Etsy store, Dirt Patch Heaven uh, at Etsy. And I think that's it. Thanks, Cats and Dogs. Oh, and Cats and Dogs has been putting up little uh, alerts on my videos in Georgia, about meetups in Georgia, if I remember correctly, is the location. So watch for that. I'm trying to remember to pin those when they come up on the video. And for those of you who like to do meet and greets and get togethers, I think that is really important to know your local people and your resources. Uh, for instance, this morning, uh, a viewer stopped me at the health food store and asked if we could use some hay. And so John and the girls are in Idaho Falls today grabbing half a ton of hay. So kind as her thank you for all the years of videos. She offered me hay this year and I really needed hay this year. So that was very kind. So yeah, it's really good to know people in your area. So for meet and greets, try to get that kind of thing together. Um, I think they can be very helpful and there's a lot of really great YouTubers out there that do them. I know that Off Grid with Doug and Stacy have theirs in the summer. I don't remember what time of year uh, Deep South Homestead does theirs, but they do a meet and greet. And so again, Cats and Dogs, uh, 1985, they are trying to uh, do a meet and greet regularly. They're in Georgia. They're in Jessup, Georgia. And if any of you others would like to post things about meet and greets you're trying to do, I will try to get them pinned as best I can. And, um, and Cats and Dogs said, uh, most of the meetups are at the Wayne County Library. Uh, I know my husband, John, is trying to do that right now. He's trying to be part of a radio network that is, what is it called? Uh, GM, GMR, GMR something types of radio. He's, he's a ham radio operator, but also a GR something. He's trying to get together with people locally so that if communication went down, there were radio uh, operators who could get information back and forth across the country. And I should probably let him do a video about that. That would be a good idea. Yes, thank you. GMRS is the one that my husband really likes, but he's also a ham radio operator. And so um, he's trying to get the kids trained in how to do all that. And he thinks it's pretty fun. So a lot of times there's if you already know how to garden, if you already know how to do permaculture, if you're already doing animals, it still doesn't hurt to get to know people locally who may have other skills. They may not know how to garden, but they may be radio operators, or they may actually farm in a way that they can get you hay if, you know, if you really needed hay, but you couldn't get it, or or grain, people who grow, grow grain, or people who have extra pallets. It's worth it to get to know people who are a little bit of a hoarder 
and um, see if you can get free lumber, things like that. So Marie said, I have a CB radio, but it's not hooked up. Yeah, I, I think all of that is a great, great uh, education. Okay, cats and dogs that have them do a video. Okay, I now have a request. I will ask John. So anyway, okay, I'm going to go let my dogs back in. They stopped fighting, but I can hear them maybe jumping over the fence to go play with the rabbits. So I really appreciate all you guys for tuning in. And um, we'll see if I can remember how to turn off the live stream. <laughs>